Mughal col colony to the much larger neighboring town of Sayyidpur, see seeking safety in numbers. At this point, one of Mehrunissa's sisters was able to migrate with her husband and children to Pakistan. But Mehrunissa's own husband was bedridden, bedridden, she tells us. What happened to him, we asked. He used to cough up blood, she says. And she had to take care of him, as well as her children, until he died in 1978. So she could not leave with her sister. She has since managed to support herself and her family by working as a maid for a Canadian aid worker. Like Salima, Mehrunissa has kinsfolk in Pakistan, but could not herself migrate because she had to care for her sick husband and then her small children. As I said, she still lives in the same place in extremely reduced circumstances. This is Maryam, who lives in a small room in a household of nine people. This room accommodates nine people. Um, in Sayyidpur. She again has lived here since 1971 and she uh, having moved from Parvatipur. Her husband too was ailing and she looked after him until his death in 1975. Now these stories all have a common narrative as I'm sure everybody here can see. These stairs on who hung on despite threats to life and limb did not always lack access to networks that might have helped them migrate. All the people discussed here were members of the Bhojpuri-speaking diaspora connected to the railways with far-flung, rich networks spread across what was now India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and indeed much further afield. But they lacked other elements of what I have elsewhere defined as mobility capital, the bundle of access and competences and dispositions that make moving possible. Strikingly, for most of the stairs on we interviewed, physical disabilities and problems with, with health were far more dramatic impediments than any lack of literacy or contacts. Many of these women were literate. Or if they were able-bodied themselves, they had powerful countervailing obligations to care for the vulnerable and infirm, whether infants, the ill, the aged or the disabled, for whom they felt responsible. Most in this category were women. This suggests, somewhat counterintuitively, that while networks, cash, know-how, and skills are all important elements of mobility, good health is vital. So also is the freedom to leave others behind, to abandon socially constructed duties of care. These stories point to the impact of patriarchies of various kinds on mobility and also on immobility. My final story throws light on the description of the graveyard with which I began. Shaheed and Jalal Ghazi are two brothers. Originally from the village of Koli Tala in the southwestern corner of present day West Bengal, it's a small, tiny village quite close to the river, Ich uh, river Ichamuti. The village was not well connected, as I said, to the transport network. It was say, served not by rail, steamer, road, nothing. After partition, Shaheed, together with many other members of the family, migrated across the border by foot. But his eldest brother, Jalal, did not. Today, Jalal, who's aged about 90, is too ill to be able to say much, so we pieced together the, the story with together with, with the help of his eldest son, Fakhruddin Ghazi, who says, we are originally from, this is I quote, we are, we are originally from Kolitala. Our whole place in Kolitala used to be Muslim. Then one day, around 1950, some refugees who had come from the other side announced that Muslims would not be allowed to live there. They would have to leave. They went from house to house. Sometimes they raped and looted. At other times, they burned down our home and granaries. My other brothers felt they would not be able to keep their honor. And so, one by one, they left. At that time, all the Muslims left this place. Our family's land used to stretch all the way to the river. Now it ends with this tiny field that surrounds our homestead. One by one, all my uncles left. One by one, all my cousins left. But being the eldest, I had to stay behind to look after the mosque and the graves of our ancestors. 
Today, this community of Muslims is reduced to about 50 people, cramped into about four homesteads. Those who, those who stayed behind, as I've indicated, had many close relatives and contacts who had made good on the other side, but still they stayed on in India. They felt bound to stay on. In the case of Jalal Ghazi, the elderly man, he felt held back by responsibilities to the graves of his ancestors to begin with, and later on by his own infirmity. His elder son, uh, eldest son, Fakhruddin, um, and his, the nev his nephew, Hamidullah Ghazi, who is also the eldest son of one of his brothers, have also stayed behind. Even though, are very f even though there are very few op opportunities for them in the locality, and despite the fact that the former was, quote, kicked out of his job at the local school after being passed over pro for promotion by a less qualified Hindu. They say they feel obliged to look after the old man who is sick and frail. Previously, Fakhruddin said, we all wanted to leave as our leaders, our cousins and uncles had left. But it is not so now. We can't go, and neither do we want to go. Their decision to stay has resulted in a catastrophic downward spiral in their wealth and status. The landholdings of this clan have shrunk to one small field. The younger men in the family are either unemployed or inappropriately employed, and they are deeply pessimistic about their prospects. Interestingly, they have now lost contact with their kinsfolk across the border. National borders, even ones as relatively porous as those between India and Bangladesh, um, have played a part in this. Ever since the Enemy Property Act came onto the statute book in 1967, and subsequently with the building of the fence, maintaining contact with, quote, enemy aliens across the border has been fraught with some danger. And this may explain why the two brothers, separated by partition, had neither seen nor heard from each other for five decades, despite the fact that they lived only 12 miles apart. Their, their brothers who migrated had only walked 12 miles. That's as far as they could go. It was only when we took news and photographs of Jalal, who you can see in the, the picture in the laptop there, over to Shaheed, who you can see wearing the haji tobi, who's he's done, rel he's been relatively prosperous in Bangladesh. It's only at this moment that, con 50 years later, that contact between the two brothers was re-established. Their story reveals a critically important point overlooked by much of the literature on networks, namely that networks atrophy and rupture in adverse circumstances after the blood brothers lost touch with each other at a moment of upheaval and chaos, the ties between them withered. Now, the familial networks that might once have facilitated their movement no longer exist. We can't go, and neither do we want to go. Those who have perceived themselves as obliged to care for others, or for even for certain objects such as graves, are bound down doubly, trebly, quadruply, each time another member of their community departs. Among the less mobile, then, it seems that an initial reluctance to move forecloses their opportunities for mi migration at a later date, keeping people like Fakhruddin and Hamidullah, and indeed the Mutawali in Calcutta, and Salima and Merunissa and others, stuck in, in their unenviable locations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chatterjee, for this very scholarly, very um, informative speech on migration, poverty, and a range of other subjects. <clears throat> Although primarily a historian, you have seen she, how she draws on the insights of a sociologist uh, and also an economist. She has linked poverty and migration, and she has differentiated between migrants and stairs on. I particularly like uh, the equation of migration with uh, mobility and stairs on with immobility. I expected, of course, to hear more about the very current situation. For example, the migration that takes place from Bangladesh 
overseas about 10 million people at any given time are working abroad and how this mobility generates employment and energizes the people in their fight against poverty. And also what I call the immobility management by millions of women and girls who come from the villages to work in the government's factories. And a comparative picture in West Bengal, does it happen in West Bengal? I mean, this is very important because migration is not simply crossing boundaries, crossing borders. But within one country, you have migration. Uh, as you cross barriers of wealth, barriers of uh, rural-urban divide, and does this migration really have anything to do with the uh, immobility management? I, this is a phrase I come up with. Uh, it's a very interesting um, lecture in which she has opened up avenues for many questions. And um, I'm sure you have many, many questions, but we have to keep the time in mind. So please be brief and uh, precise in your questions. I would like uh, younger people to be more asking more questions than people of my age. But I ask uh, Professor Saad Andalib to come here and take on the very difficult uh, role of the moderator of the Q&A session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And um, since there are only two ch uh, chairs over there, I'll take my seat on the audience. I have been given the unenviable role of being the enforcer. So my jobs will be enforcement. Essentially, uh, in the interest of getting a lot of questions uh, for our speaker, I'd like the introductions to be very short. I would like to know who you are. Uh, please identify yourself. But uh, let's stick to the questions instead of long preamble, because then we do not get to the issues quickly. So. I'm laying down the rule as an enforcer rule. So let's start. We have uh, microphones on both sides. And I will go and sit there. And I will raise my hands if I think that this is going on too long. And you then sort of uh, cut down the preamble and get to the question. Thank you. I am from Bragg Institute of Governance and Development. Uh, I've been listening to your lecture with uh, a lot of interest. Uh, a very simple uh, question from my side is that uh, the sheer number of migrants from East Bengal to West Bengal and the reverse number from West Bengal to East Bengal is uh, the difference is, I mean, very vast. And uh, I don't think uh, mere access to uh, mobility network explains that. So, uh, so what's, what's your take on that? On the, 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 the about 25 percent population of West Bengal is actually migrant from East Bengal, but same is not uh, in case of Bangladesh. I mean, the migrants from West Bengal is very, uh, very small percentage. So, uh, so, so that's my basically my question. That there are other bigger factors which has actually. Uh, so, what's your take on that? Thank you. Let's take two or three questions, and then we'll, we'll have the answers. Is there anyone else? My name is Ria Kuddin. I'm an urban planner. Uh, my question is, uh, I, I'm always trying to make sense of the study in terms of uh, epistemological significance of, uh, say, because I'm an urban planner, I don't think of uh, issues more on a, um, in an historical perspective. In many cases, scale matters, like how many people are involved uh, in, an, in a particular uh, knowledge exercise. So apparently, this is a challenging uh, scholarly endeavor in a sense that it 
seems to be uh, something that does not affect like a large number of people. So, considering that, uh, how do scholars think of this kind of study to draw interest of scholars? And I, I, I think that in a way it's kind of challenging for the scholar. So, how do they overcome this challenge, or do they face any difficulty in kind of making this kind of uh, scholarly activity uh, received among scholars who are particularly interested in large scale of impact or things like that. Thank you. One more. We will move to some answers. Manzo Ahmed from Institute of Education, Prague University. Uh, very interesting presentation. Mobility and immobility uh, are presented as sort of counterpoints. Mobility is somehow good and opening up opportunities and so on. And immobility make people stuck and so on. Is that the case? It's, uh, it's not that simple, I guess. Mobility also has its prices. And uh, you can see right now what is happening in Europe or even here in this uh, part of the world, people trying to move and losing their lives and so on. And immobility, not really immobility or stuck, but it's really further marginalization and pauperization and exploitation and so on. I mean, whatever their situation, they're not just stuck, but it's getting much farther worse. So uh, both sides, uh, there are more complex issues. So I guess uh, that's something <laughs> stuck with me. Thank you very much. Those are some important and challenging questions. Um, as to the question of the uh, difference between the migration between West Bengal, I mean the flows from east to west versus west to east, uh, it is significant, but I, would, I think that it's vast, to say it's vast is perhaps an exaggeration. Um, but, but there are very particular historical um, patternings that have determined those flows. Uh, the, uh, by and large, the, um, the, the first and largest streams have been who, of the Hindus who flowed, um, migrated to West Bengal, were people who, had, who were well networked, who already had places and homes in, in Calcutta, uh, who, who were educated, etc., etc., and had money, um, who tended to be the uh, upper class Hindus of uh, in East Bengal. It, it was relatively easy for them to leave. Similarly, uh, people in the commercial classes. The next group that left tended to be artisans who serviced Hindus in particular. So, for instance, idol makers, bangle makers, etc. Those groups also tended to leave easily. The poorer you get, got, um, the, the the this the pressures to move or the ability to move was more and more and more constrained. I think that's definitely the case. Um, in the case of uh, the movement of Muslims in the other direction, the patterns were very. I mean, the the patterns of poverty to begin with were very, very different. Um, and again, you have, but still you have a similar pattern. You still have, um, you know, uh, the migration of, of um, educated elites, men of commerce, artisan groups, uh, you know, all the soap makers, candle makers, book makers, leather workers, for instance, fled from Calcutta um, uh, immediately after the, uh, during the riots of 1964, but other groups did not. But there has been a, 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 a reclustering and ghettoizing of the Muslims who stayed behind. So it's a very complicated question. Um, I'm not trying to say that this, um, I, but I, what, what I am trying to do in this is say, well, if, if people stay, what is the thought process or the, um, that goes into their staying, what are the pressures upon them that make them stay, and then what are the consequences of those decisions to stay? These questions have not really been asked. In terms of the question, secondly, about scale, to say this is a small-scale problem, 
uh, I beg with the greatest respect to disagree. I mean, if you think about, for instance, recently, I don't know if you've read in India, the Sachar Commission's report on Muslim poverty. The, I mean, Muslims in India primarily are Muslims of, of, of the poorer groups who have been profoundly impoverished by their decision to stay on, so much so the Sachar Commission, Commission found that Muslims are now the most disadvantaged community in India, even more disadvantaged than many of the scheduled castes and tribes. So the scale of the problem is, is quite considerable. I mean, I'm talking in terms of small groups because I'm trying to make the problem explainable to you in human terms, to make their understanding and make their reasoning accessible to you in human terms. These are not small numbers of people. If you think about the numbers of people who are simply off the grid anyway, they're not small numbers. How we, how we think about um, you know, their choices and their, their abilities is, all, is, a, is a very significant problem. Um, and finally, with the gentleman here, of course, I, I mean, when I, when I was saying mo mobility is not necessarily a great thing. Mobility involves price. Mobility involves all sorts of um, issues, both psychic and emotional and um, uh, financial and uh, you know, all kinds of issues come with it. But nonetheless, I think what we are looking at, what the reason I've chosen this study is because this is an extreme scenario. This was a scenario in which if you moved, you had a chance to live. If you stayed, you were likely to die. These people who stayed, about 19 members of the people, their family were slaughtered. Yeah, after that. I mean, many of the, 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 the Ghazi family that I'm talking about, for instance. So when you have life and death situations in which you know, obviously one, I hope life is better than death in that sense. And when people are forced to make a situation which, or, or, or people are taking a decision which puts them in danger of death, then you need to ask the question, why? Yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to make a, um, a, a, a the claim that, it, that migration solves every problem. I am making the claim, and I will insist on the claim, that migration gives people access to certain routes through, or, or escape routes from problems in certain circumstances. Um, and, and, and that perhaps has been um, the case. I just, I just uh, gave, uh, uh, gained the permission to open this up to other issues as well. It does not have, the discussion does not need to be limited to migration issues. So I mean, as all of you know, she has done a lot of work on other issues. And I think if there are some questions aside, uh, you're most welcome to ask them. Please one introduce last, yourself. One last question on migration. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Well, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Zia. We met this afternoon. <laughs> you see, in your presentation, you didn't mention this. So I'm not sure if your study covers another dimension of migration, which is taking place. Millions of Bengalis have migrated all across the world, and they're still doing. So does your study cover this dimension of migration? You done? Yes. All right, thank you. Another, another question here, please. Oh, you didn't go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Enon Nakash from Dhaka University, Economics Department. Uh, I was wondering whether you have taken into account of those who went away and they are completely divorced, separated from those who stayed on. Or there was uh, some remittance sent to the people who were left behind. 
whether that account was taken in your study. And uh, why then those people who went away were completely oblivious of their relatives, whereas those who stayed stay, had to stay because of their human sentiment for those who, uh, who were dependent upon it. Thank you. Uh, one more question here from I'm moving away from migration. My name is Moyali. I publish books and also try and publish in Banda. And what should be another book to read? So, without Without this book in Bangla, we quite well considering other Bangla writers there, and from which I would like to concentrate. To My first question would be that this, is, this study comes time when Brack has chosen to invite distinguished scholars in the series which they are going to have. And we're going to be open up open up the vista of education in my mind. I'm glad that you all first of all. I congratulate you of my sons were for having me. Because there are younger people, younger <coughs> people who were either born in 71 or just before 71, we had a group which we to organize seminars for them to understand 71. And the result was that we did not understand that they, they understood 71 as we did. So I hope I, I hope I hope I can give myself clear. Yeah, we thought of talking to them and this part we found out that they found the accounts written by the pro-71 people in Bangladesh were very different greatly varied, and at times belied each other. And for that, they needed something objective. So there was nothing objective as such. We started a series called Road to Dhaka, Road to Bangladesh. 